Okay, well, welcome to the Sisyphus Complex Solution, which is going to be a channel dedicated to new methods, new thinking around politics and how the process of politics is supposed to be taken forward rather than the reactionary process that seems to be taking place in various quarters around the world. Um, it's not going to be for the faint at heart, it's not going to be simplistic, it's not going to be ideological or anything of that nature. It is going to be, oh, from off chair will sit still, it is going to be a bit of an old man in a chair type of scenario, but you know, get over it. Nobody else seems to be uh, providing any solutions, so I might as well give it a go and see, see how we go from here. So, what I want to be able to do within this episode and that is give it a bit of an explanation as to exactly what it is that's going to be taking place. I've run through this several times in practice and meaning to try to release this for a while now. Um, it never works out perfect, but hope on. That's why it's going to be over a number of different uh, a number of different broadcasts, basically over YouTube predominantly. So I did put up a bit of a uh, an advisory that. I will be prone to speak in my mind, I will be prone to a few choice words. So if you're out there and you're one of these easily offended, then fuck off. Get and go and watch something else. Um, so, what I want to concentrate now is the explanations of things. Now, most people want an explanation first and foremost as to who I am. I don't really care about trying to explain who I am, to be honest. Um, you'll come to know me as things go forward and as we progress and hopefully there'll be some backwards and forwards with people that want to get involved in this as well because this is not about me saying how politics should be run, how your country should be run you know I'm not running for Prime Minister or anything like that and it is, it is a solution that uh, can be implemented in any country if enough people get together to actually give it a go so, the first part of the explanation is going to have to be a little bit of uh, self-indulgence and something I'm going to remind myself of and that and that is basically, it's all down to uh, having to explain to myself what's the deal with me hair because as you know we've been through the lockdown and everything like that um, hairdressers have been available for a couple of weeks now but I haven't been which means I've got my hair doing this silly Steven Seagull, if I can't really see it, but it's the piss poor man Steven Seagull impression, which is difficult because Steven Seagull is also a piss poor impersonation of himself. But I put it all back because if I don't do that, I end up looking like this. And I'm sure there's been a quite a few people out there and that, that are running through the lockdown looking not entirely dissimilar. So. The one slight part that I have for myself that gives me a little bit of justification is it's not the first time I've had this midlife crisis of letting me hair grow. Um, I did have something similar a few years back. A god awful grainy picture of me with Marky Ramon and Makoto Akuyawa, uh, who's from. If you don't know who these people are, then just look it up in that. But Marky Ramon was from the Ramones. Makoto is from Sheena and the Rockets. I was doing a tour with them out in Japan where I lived for 16 years. So, Nihon no Minasama, had we mashed it. And there you go, that's about as much of that you're going to get out of me. So, I have made that mistake in the past. How long I'll keep this for, I don't know. But anyway, that's a tiny bit about me. So, the next stage is around the name of the Sisyphus Complex Solution. and who the hell is Sisyphus. I'm sure there's a great many people out there that understand who Sisyphus is from Greek mythology but then there's always people that don't. So for their benefit there's an explanation. I'm not going to read out the whole thing. I'm not really bothered about that type of thing so if anybody wants to read it here's the, here's the moment where you press the pause button. And I have a drag of me fag. I will be smoking copiously throughout this by the way. As well as having a drink. So, for the people that are not familiar with who Sisyphus is, it is part of Greek mythology. He was 
uh, a character that not a particularly nice individual uh, and he'd cheated death during his various under undergoings undertakings whatever the whatever you want to express it and because he cheated death he pissed off Zeus who then when death did finally catch up with him he condemned him to roll a rock up a hill in continuity for the rest of his existence cheers and the reason why that's relevant is because politics has become very much a case of everything just seems to be on this cycle of repeating repeating there's no uh, there's no innovation there's no original thought they seem to just be on a loop of getting getting through having your career become your politician appear on the television appear on whatever media it is concentrate on whatever little minor narrative that is that you've decided to uh, concentrate on this week and to deflect and have the public go run, running around whether that be obviously not the key things in that at the moment and that you've got the the virus which I'm not really going to go into in any great detail in this situation I do enough moaning about that anybody that knows me not knows me from LinkedIn will know that uh, I do make my opinions known about the virus there's things like Brexit as well and then there's obviously out in America like you got everybody going absolutely ape shit over Donald Trump there's no real thought taking place amongst any of the countries and that as to how they're actually supposed to be progressing properly as opposed to the uh, what are they called the postmodernists and their bullshit bastardization of language and that where they call pro call things progressive which are the entire exact opposite it's all regressive nonsense so it's using Sisyphus as the anomaly and that analogy I'll get my words right that shows how politics has run at the moment and how it's become this never-ending cycle and so to, for us to be able to try and work together to come up with a solution as to how we can actually start progressing forward rather than making the mistakes that an awful lot of people are doing at the moment particularly in the likes of universities and what have you where they are pushing this failed agenda of socialism and communism and blah blah I mean yeah let's just repeat killing another hundred million people it's just an absolute nonsense so it's 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 a solution to be able to refrain from making those mistakes so nice glare on, on my glasses so the background to this and here's where you'll start to understand a little bit more about me and how I've come to uh, make these kinds of suggestions Obviously, I've had a, an interest in politics going back a long way. And it does start from prior to my ability to even vote. Um, but there was one, there's one specific individual that had developed a, a method of looking at politics from a much more measured perspective. And that's a guy by the name of John Hoskins, who came up with is John Hoskins wiring diagram obviously at the moment that you're not gonna be able to see the whole screen but don't worry about it if you want to be able to get the diagram itself all you have to do is look up the John Hoskins government wiring map and he's essentially looking towards not only what the government departments are but what the policies are what the cause and effect is and how you should actually take things forward this particular um, scenario was developed in, and I have to have had this written down because I'm shit at remembering things like this. Um, he was he worked for the uh, the Centre for Policy Studies, and this started in around about 1974, but it came to notoriety in 1977 when it gained the attention of a certain Mrs. Thatcher, who used that for her at least her initial uh, policies and methods of running the country from. The election win in 1979. Um, 
not going to have arguments with people about how good and how bad that was. Personally, I thought it was good, but hey ho. But the key point is, is that these people had sat in this think tank and thought about how you actually do run a government. How do, how do things actually operate? If you make a policy decision on one particular department, how does that affect all of the others? And then eventually, how does that affect the country? Does the government need to be operating in certain spaces? Things of this nature. So it's not an original idea that I'm coming up with here, but it is bringing it up to date to take take a look and see what it is that we've actually got at the moment. So where I've operated in this area before is that, I mean, you'll notice from the, um, the introduction, there's a key sponsor written in there and that, which is the company ICPL 1200, which is conveniently my company. Now, I'm not gonna be going on some great advertising spree as to you need to now get in touch with my company and I'm going to do several pages to promote myself. That's not what this channel is about. But every now and again, some of the stuff that I am involved with and have been involved with historically, I will be referring to that. And I'll do that in this instance because you're going to need to understand a little bit about how the process is developed, what the thought process is in within doing that in being able to achieve a real good understanding. So we don't end up in this scenario, as I've said, that you get led by the nose to say, oh, well, the government is about how much you're going to spend on the NHS, for example, or how much you're going to spend on education. It's not about just looking at things on such a, a narrow view. You have to have an understanding as to what your entire government looks like. So I want to give you a bit of an example of some work that I've done previously, which Worked out, worked out all right for me, um, in so much as that I, I, mean, I learned a hell of a lot in doing it, and I learned a hell of a lot in terms of what shouldn't be done, more than what should be done. Now, the example that I've got for you is, well, not this. This is, this is giving some of the services that I do within ICPR 1200, which are going to give you a bit of a foundation as to why I've come to look at things in the way that I have through modern process methods. There's a whole bunch of the, the types of uh, services that the, comp the company provides, the, the business process, manufacturing processes and things of this nature. There is one part in there that some of the, uh, the more excitable people around certain agendas at the moment, if you see the term Industry 4.0, it is not what some people think it is and it's certainly not as advanced as some people think it is but anyway again if there's people that want to check to see what kind of processes it is that enabled me to move forward into this direction again press the pause button have a look and then you'll get a bit of an idea but what i wanted to actually move forward to is this i'd run this uh group called the uh well, i'll have to remind myself of what i called it International EV Industry Infrastructure Group. There you go. It's a bit of a fucking mouthful, isn't it? Essentially, what I'd done there is because of work that I'd been involved with in both process and work with the automotive sector, we'd had the issue of diesel gate, and then there was everybody turning around saying, okay, well, we need to have electric vehicles, etc., etc. It was quite apparent to me that. Obviously, the people that I was dealing with at the time, they were looking, OK, well, how, how are we going to be changing the vehicles in terms of the technology? I mean, is it going to be batteries? Is it going to be hydrogen? If, what type of battery is it going to be? How is the infrastructure developed from that? And various people were looking at it from their individual perspective. So I thought, well, OK, that, that's, that's fine. I mean, I can, it's understandable. But in terms of how you actually develop an entire picture to be able to run a nation on such a massive shift, first and foremost, you need to know what that involves. And then you need to understand what the technical requirements are and all of this kind of scenario. So I'd started off by just putting a, a very simple wiring map together. Red wine, lovely. Anyway. There's no need for me to go into enormous amounts of detail on this, 
because it's it's not going to be relevant overall uh, because we're going to be talking about politics. But it's going to give you a bit of an idea as to how I'm going to be approaching this, what the start points are, how you actually go about developing a process so you understand what government is. So you're not you're not a teenager that's just jumping up and down and going, I don't like this and I don't like that and I want to change it without having a clue what it is that you're looking to change or how you're going to change it. So as it was with the um, the electric vehicle sector, uh, various areas that uh, led me down a few other paths of understanding how incredibly poorly this had been looked at and continues to be incredibly poorly looked at. So you start off with that and then I'm, I'm going to flick through these quite quickly because it's not relevant. It's just giving you an idea. Essentially, once you've once you've got some idea of what that wiring map looks like and what the confounders are, you then need to start breaking it down into the different subsections so you can get a better perspective of what it is that you're needing to deal with within there, within that within that wider subject matter. Because you can't really look towards planning until you know. So you can't look towards implementation until you've gone through the planning process and understood in particular, and what I found within this particular piece of work was that, uh, and this isn't the final draft by the way, what you do tend to find is that you'll be coming across all of the risks. Now, when it comes down to risks, this one, I'm just gonna leave it on here for a minute and that looks like it, do, it doesn't matter, you don't have to worry about it too much. When you're looking at the risks, it doesn't end. It can't end up being one of these never-ending concerns where somebody's going to say, "Well, have you thought of this and have you thought of that?" And then you spend so much time, "Have you thought of?" that you never actually do anything. There's got there's got to be a kind of a cut-off point there. But you still have to have a living document. Essentially, once you've got your plan in place, it becomes a living document. You don't have everything set in stone. You're continuously going to be learning, and once you're once you're setting things out in this fashion you're more likely to understand what the additional confounders are you're more likely to understand what those additional risks are you're more likely to understand what those if there's going to be any cause and effect the cost implications implications to the wider public and so on and so forth this particular area and that's it's uh, it came up with so many so many problems that as much as I was running this group with, in discussion with a whole range of different people from automotive, energy, um, the charging systems, etc., etc., though I mean the one thing that kept on coming forward was how little anybody knew what they were talking about, and that was why it was so important to be able to put this together. But by the end of that, I, I just thought, well, you're all so clueless. It really isn't worth bothering with. Plus, they're basically looking towards uh, solving a problem that doesn't exist, which is uh, another area of politics that you have to be very, very, very careful of. So many times you'll end up with this scenario that is quite, quite common, I would imagine most people are accustomed to it now. Uh, particularly from the mainstream media, that they will say, okay, this, this particular problem has taken place. It's a massive emergency. We have to do something about it. Then when you look behind the details, you find out it's not an emergency at all. There isn't really that much of a problem, and quite often there isn't a problem at all. It has literally been a case of them going, we need to have a nice big news story. The people pushing the agenda behind it are like, well, you know, Let's distract everybody over there while we're taking the piss over this side. You have to be very cautious of these types of things. So, moving through all the different scenarios, I mean, I say benchmarking is also a critical part of things when you're looking towards the, the costs. Because one of the parts that we will be starting to look into in quite a bit of detail I'll, m I'll move on to some of the explanations of it shortly how much money is going through governments how much responsibility they have how that is affecting the general public 
These are all critical areas that, that are so seldom looked at with, with any level of responsible detail at all. It's, it's quite staggering as to why people don't question things as much. Now, I know everybody's... They've got the, you've got your day job, no different to me. You've got your day job, then you've got your evenings, you might have your kids to look after, look after and so forth. You don't really have the time to go through all of these different aspects and you don't have the time to, especially around election time, you don't have the time to run through the manifestos and make sure that they're going through every single element. But it does beg the question as to why not? Because if you're not really looking at everything on a, as a whole picture, then you'd be surprised what's getting pushed through that you don't know about. Uh, obviously, not all pieces of government are for uh, human, human, public consumption. <laughs> that could be a Freudian slip, couldn't it? Um, not everything is for public consumption. So, for example, like your defence sector and things of this nature, you're not really going to start publishing that around the world and letting everybody know what you're doing. But you still need to have some basic grasp as to what's going on and what the policies are and what the plans are. So this quick run through here is giving you a bit of an insight as to how the process starts to develop and when you're really starting to look at the level of detail that you need to have your politicians and your government to be taken care of. It's not a matter of These are the politicians, this is what their ideology is. You know, like we're the Conservatives, so therefore we're supposed to be financially frugal, which they no longer are. They are basically just blue socialists. And it's not the the Labour Party that would just literally tax everybody to death and destroy everything. Same type of scenarios that I mean like when you can see it out in the US at the moment and that with the Democrats that have gone completely apeshit, and Trump that, I don't, I don't know, there's, there's, I've got some nagging doubts about Trump at the moment, but like I say, all for a later date. It's not really what we're here to talk about. What we need to be doing is understanding what their role is, what their position is, that they could, they could be like the voice of how things are being presented, not only within the nation, but how it's being presented abroad. What the overall plan is supposed to be, what the achievements are, so on and so forth. We, I think most people understand that a very large percentage of that work is not done at the political level. It is done in what Trump would call the swamp and what in the UK we would call the civil service or the public service for which they generally don't give much of a shit about the public, but anyway. It's it's how how those how that mechanics works, what it is they're actually up to, what the accountability is, and how you'd hope to see things structured moving forward. Because the less that people understand, the less that people know the more you end up with essentially a, a very big problem and the problem that everybody's always talking about. So one of the things that uh, I do find quite amusing, um, particularly of late, where there's all of the ranting and raving saying that capitalism doesn't work, you know, we're, this is why we're going to have to destroy everything and go back to socialism. Yeah, right. Um, I would love a socialist to explain to me which country in the world operates on a capitalist system. Because the simple fact of the matter is anybody that is screaming capitalism, capitalism is responsible for all of our woes, immediately I know they're an idiot because there is no country that operates on a purely capitalist system. The closest explanation that we have at the moment in terms of a name for the system that we all, op that at least in the West, that we operate in, is rhyme capitalism, which essentially means that 
no, and there's two parts to this. It's free market plus social policy. So your social policy, and that is going to be the things like your police, fire brigade, blah blah, uh, social, the welfare state in terms of the uh, the UK, and the biggest one of all, and that which is uh, the NHS, which has a little country attached to it called the UK. But the free market side of things would be the literal interpretation from within Ryan capitalism. But the problem is there is that we don't have a free market either. We have a regulated market. So for anybody in their wildest dreams to think that a regulated market with very heavy cost, massive burden, social policy, if they think that is capitalism, then there's a reason why those people are all idiots. So what we have to understand is what it is that we're actually operating in and what it is that we're looking to change. Because within that system and within the regulation side and within the, the social policy side, we have to understand that the lack of accountability, the lack of everybody understanding exactly what's going on, that's where things like corruption can take place. That's where cronyism takes place because nobody's looking. There is no accountability. It's just, it's too open to people running off in directions and that, and like I say, using the media in particular, and let's say, well, look at that problem over there that doesn't exist. All the public look over there, they crack on, rip everybody off, cause all manner of problems, and you're none the wiser because you're not paying attention. Is that, is that everybody's fault? Mm, to a degree. To a degree it is. Um, like I say, you do get everybody get wrapped, wrapped up in their own lives and things of this nature, but you still have to pay a bit of attention. If for nothing else than that, I mean, it's good for your bloody brain just to understand what the hell is going on and who you should be voting for. And for that matter, should we really be voting for anybody? Because that is also a potential for the, the progress of a new way of doing things, a new way of running your country that is much more evidence-based. And now I'm sure somebody out at the Smithsonian will say that uh, I'm now expressing my whiteness, Pratt. But the more people understand, the better position they're going to be to be able to make the best of their own lives. And it is not up to the government to do that for you it simply isn't so some of the details that we're going to be needing to look for this is obviously something from uh, 2009 2010 um, I don't know who produced this um, but it is it's a pretty a pretty good way of uh, putting the UK budget into some kind of perspective it's it's not the way that I will be doing things um, because I don't, I, I do appreciate that people like to have, okay, you know, here's a nice little pretty picture and here's the little numbers here and there. But most people will just look at that and go, okay, well, let's look at the, the main pictures in the middle, the main numbers, not really necessarily understanding how it all breaks down. But at least you've got something there to say, right, it's a one pager. It's giving you some indication of, the size of government for a start and as I'll be coming to show you shortly this is very much out of date and doesn't come close to the amount of money being spent and the ridiculous level of bureaucracy which again anybody thinks that this is a capitalist nation and for the people out, anybody out in the US as well, you run you run a similar program to what I'm going to be putting forward. You're going to find something not entirely dissimilar to this. So when you're all sitting there and that and going, okay, our wonderful capitalist system, when you see something like this, no, you're not. So my preference is going to be to have things not done in in the simplistic way of here's a nice pretty little picture that you might be able to pick out a couple of bit, a few pieces of information. I prefer to do things the way that they're supposed to be done. 
write out the balance sheet, find out exactly how much is being spent, where is being spent, and let people read things properly. One of the key problems that we've ended up with as a society as a whole is kind of like the boardroom mentality, where the chief exec, I don't, I don't have time to read through everything, so just put everything on a couple of pages, and then they wonder why they miss everything. So when you're looking at how much money is being, how much revenue there is, it's not really revenue, it's just tax, it's just taking from people. How much is coming in? Where's it being spent? What's the value? Are the public getting the value that they deserve? These are critical areas and that that should be put out in a proper balance sheet. A proper, do, thing, do things in a, in a proper way. You've got your balance sheet, you've got your profit and loss, etc. Though obviously in, that, in the government there isn't going to be a profit. So, but lay, lay the information out in the way that it should be. So, if we move this forward to today, the kind of information that we're going to be looking towards getting is, this is just, again, this is just an indication. This is not what the final product is going to look like. This is not what the final plan is going to look like. And there's a big reason why it's not going to look like this. It's because of the keywords that you can see on... I'm pointing in the wrong places. Essentially, in that you can see the words that guesstimated, two separate lo locations, guesstimated. What level of government is being so unaccountable that the amount of money being spent is a guesstimate? It, it just it just should not be that way. It should never be that way. It should be a precise figure. You have taken our money and you have spent it how? So we have to be starting to dig into all of this kind of thing. And the reason why we're going to be digging into these kinds of things is because if you are looking towards having some kind of political system that everybody can actually start to get some level of support around and understand we're going to need to break down all of these details. We're going to need to understand how much is being spent. We're going to need to know how much is being ripped off. We're going to need to understand what are the problems, if any, which there are, being passed on to future generations, particularly because of things like this lockdown at the moment. Countries are putting themselves in absolute dire straits, and it's all going to be passed down. For what? So that our generations and that can be sat here and go, well, I was all right. The kids can pay for it. It, ma it makes no sense whatsoever. So we need to be looking at things in a much more responsible way. I'll put it that way. So this is part of some of the preparation work that I've done. And it's just going to give you a bit of a perspective, again, because the camera and so forth and that, it's covering over part of it. Don't worry about that. I'll be uh, laying things out so that it does appear on the scheme properly as we're going forward. But around a year, 18 months ago, something like that, I, start, I, I did start this um, Sisyphus Complex Solution project. And... I started looking at the size of government and I was thinking, well, would I be able to make one of those nice little bubble maps and see how well it all works out? And the answer is basically no, you can't do that because the size of government is staggering in this country, in the UK. And what I want people to do in that in other countries, anybody that happens to be watching this, I'll be running through the process in future episodes to let you know where to look, how to look and how to start gathering the information for yourself so that you or any think tanks or any other groups can get together and say right well how do we actually put this together. 
But we're not, so I'm, I'm looking at it from a UK perspective. You just have to emulate it for your own country. So when I started looking through and I go, right, okay, so if you've got the, you've got your central government department, well, within each government department, how many other departments are there? And this is essentially, and you might, you, you may or may not be surprised as to what's going to go on because I'm going to be now showing you a few different slides. They may, quite a few of them may look like they're the exact same thing, but they're not. They're all departments within departments within departments. And the size of the UK is just staggering. And it makes you wonder what in hell the vast majority of these departments actually do. What is it that people are paying for? And then how is it that we've allowed this level of unquestioning to get to this kind of, and, and you also have to remember, this is also under a conservative government. I mean, everybody expects, at least in the UK, it's traditionally been expected that a conservative government would look to make the government as efficient as possible. This is not efficiency. So even during the period from when um, David Cameron became the Prime Minister, so from 2010, lots of people complaining about austerity. And I know that a number of people have had hard times since the crash, was it 2008, whatever it was. But it wasn't really what anybody could justifiably call austerity. It just wasn't. You don't end up with a government as big as this when you've been running a, an, austerity, an austerity program. It's just phenomenal, the size of it. And this is gonna be a part of the understanding for everybody to say, right, okay, if you have people, for example, that want to do this, uh, do the marches and all this sort of stuff, and they go, okay, we want equality for this, that, and the other. Uh, you're, not, you're not gonna make governments better by shouting at them on a single issue. It's just, it will never work. All you're gonna be doing that is putting a tiny little plaster on a massive gaping gash. It just, it makes no sense whatsoever. So we need to be looking at what is it that we're actually dealing with? What do we need? What do we not need? What can be combined? Does it actually provide a decent function? There has to be levels of comprehension as to how your country is run. Now, because the first few slides there were related to the major departments, then moved into the list of the non-ministerial and other government departments. And again, the list is just staggering. And as this progresses, what I want to be able to do with everybody is quite literally go through each one. On one by one, go, do we really need this? What do they do? Who is in there? How many people work in each department? How much does it cost? All of these details we need to be looking at because if there are going to be any changes whatsoever, it needs to be done from a whole picture perspective and not just fiddling around the edges. Now, the one key part that I want to be absolutely certain about and that everybody understands is that an important part of running through this process is that you have to understand these will always be people's jobs. Now, it's all very well and good for like a libertarian or a traditional conservative to say, oh, well, you know, we need to trim the fat off of this. We need to get rid of this and cut the budgets of this, that, and the other. All very well and good, but if, for example, and this is a big if, and that works, so we have to run through this properly together. If you, 
if you ran through the programme and say, OK, right, we can reduce government departments by 50%. Now, does that mean reducing the workforce by 50%? If it did mean that, you can't just have a plan that says we're going to cut 50% of the jobs and have nothing for these people to do. You have to have some responsible thinking there. Where are people going to then find their new opportunities, whether that be in employment, whether that be starting a new business of some description? There has to be something in place, some thought process in place, so you're not going in there and creating mass unemployment. That also comes down to the policies that you look to in, implement. What is, what is the cause and effect of each policy that you're considering? Whether that be fiscal policies, infrastructure policies, welfare policies, all of these different things, you have to understand what it is that is going to be the implications of what it is that you're thinking of doing. To not do that would be massively irresponsible. Okay, so I will be very critical within a whole range of different departments to say, don't need this, don't need that, don't need the other. But I'm not doing that from the perspective of saying, you can all get fired and to hell with you. I'm not, I'm not a callous bastard, so we all need to be thinking about essentially what a government is supposed to be, which is supposed to be thinking about the people within the nation. Um, now, within the nation, there is, generally, generally speaking, that you're looking at things from a, a micro and a macro perspective. Micro is, generally speaking, is national. Then macro, what kind of policies and what kind of relationships you will have with other countries. That's all very well and good. Within each nation, there is consistently a level and this is something that where there's commonality between the UK and the US, where you have the national level and then the local level. So with the US, you'll have the national and then the state. Now, the areas that I'm going to be looking at are the micro from the national perspective. If I was to look, if I was to put local in there as well, this list would be considerably larger. So that will also be another part to be looked at after we've taken care of the national side of things. But what we're needing to understand is all the different equations for how the country is to be run as a whole, then any sort of, well, even down to the relevance of local governance, because sometimes it's it's not really clear as to whether they are being given that level of responsibility, um, whether they are having certain restraints put on them. Um, I suppose within the UK and that we could say there's the uh, the devolved governments and that's like there's Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland. Um, you know, which, whichever way we end up taking that discussion, I'm, e I'm easy on that, I don't really care. Um, as long as there's accountability there, and as long as we understand what's going on. Um, I would certainly look towards, in as much as we'd need to look towards changing things from a national perspective for the UK as a whole, and what most people would consider to be England, so the likes of the Boris Johnsons and what have you, in Parliament, I would also be looking towards similar levels of accountability for particularly within places like Scotland because how you've got a party in Scotland that behaves the way that they do is just beyond me. Anyway, moving on. All right, so all of those ones prior to and then there's a little bit at the, a few more at the top here. It gives you some perspective as to the size of the task ahead and there's a few other pieces of information in there and a bit of which I've already covered. The size of the task ahead is 
a little bit much for some people. Um, it is something where people's like, like I say, if you don't have the time and all this sort of stuff, he's like, I can't really look at it from that big of a picture. You will literally do what the fella is doing that and put your hand over your eyes and go, I can't deal with this. There are ways of being able to meet that kind of problem, which is that you can have people that will deal with things on a, a specialised sector. So, you know, I mean, if you do have your interest in finance, if you've got the capability and understanding within finance and you know how people get ripped off in particular, then had, adding some value there, absolutely fine. You, know, you only need to concentrate on what it is that you're capable of looking at. And you can, you can have these things set up so that I hate to use the word collective because that has terrible connotations, again, falling back into the socialism and communism and all that sort of crap. Because one of the things about this, by the way, is that in particular, when you're looking towards the, uh, the financial side of things and the policy implications, we have to have what is known as a lessons learned, a register of lessons learned. I know people are familiar with the term lesson learned, but they're also familiar with the fact that nobody ever learns those lessons. So we'd have to have, to have something in there that says, right, we do understand that something has been tried before. We do understand that it fails and that we're not going to make that mistake again. You're not going to be the mental cases that do the same thing over and over and over again and expecting a different result. There is not going to be a scenario where we say, oh, socialism, oh, yeah, that wasn't quite socialism, well, but we've got, we're going to get it right this time. No, that's not going to happen because, especially because every time you have people that are pushing a socialist agenda, they are the most incredible retards. The chances that they've come up with a new idea that makes any sense is just zilch. So that is not going to happen. We do set up the lessons learned. Otherwise, like I say, you're going to end up falling back into the Sisyphus complex solutions. Not the solution, but the Sisyphus complex. Again, you're going to be repeating that area. You're going to keep pushing that rock again. So we're looking to avoid that. Okay. I can't, I've kind of forgotten what my thread is, but never mind. Now, because this is going to be quite complex, it is going to be something that is going to be running over quite a period of time. I do think there is a level of relative urgency over that. And that is something that I'll get to reasons why in a few moments. But it's not something that needs to be done in a panic and it's never something that should be done in a panic. If we can, oh, I've remembered now, collectivism, yes. Collectivism in terms of having a variety of different inputs. Absolutely fine, no problem with that at all. Uh, I don't approach this from the perspective of, I know best on every single subject out there and every single department and how it all, what entails what, what the implications are for everything. I don't pretend to know everything, within reason. But the, so there is always gonna be people that can contribute to things and know more than I do. <laughs> Hopefully. Um, in the way that uh, so many people coming out of universities in particular and that, that really don't know their ass from their elbow. I have worked with some academics and people that are supposed to, you know, the scientists and the experts. My God. People with some practical experience and understanding would be good. Joe Public, in general, understands more than most of those idiots. But it'd be, it'd be a good way in that to have people having some input. How exactly I'm going to work things for people to have that input, this is something I'll be working towards. Because like I said, this is the first programme. It's going to go out onto YouTube. I'll see what kind of response that I get. Um, I am available on LinkedIn as well, by the way. Just look for Paul Buckingham. You'll recognise my ugly mug. See what kind of input people can provide. 
so that you know that this isn't going to become the, the latest ideology of one individual. Paul thinks this, Paul thinks that, Paul thinks the other. It, that's not the way this is supposed to work. Okay. Even I know, well, is an expression that uh, my dad used to say was uh, the last person on earth that thought he knew anything, knew everything, ended up nailed to a cross. So I've got no intention of that up there. I do like my cigarettes, by the way. Any sponsors out there from cigarettes and things like that, feel free. S cigarettes and alcohol, definitely. So, I think, ideally, people have some level of understanding as to what it ha the, the kind of approach that I'm looking to make. And like I say, it will be a long process. There are areas that uh, require a bit more urgency than others, but we'll, we'll, you know, we'll deal with it. We'll deal with it. It doesn't really matter. What I do want to do is look towards avoiding certain other people who have also developed their own little processes, but just not in not not in this way. They've developed things in a slightly slightly different manner. Some of you will be familiar with this, others won't. Now, this leads into a part that the show is going to have a second segment. So I'll, the, the first part will be based on, okay, we're now going to be dealing with today's part of the process as to how we could run a country and run it with competence evidence-based, understanding, goals set in mind, all of the rest of it, what we're actually looking to achieve and what actually does look like progress. The necessary segment is going to be effectively what we're up against. And it is it is partially your own government, but it's not entirely your own government. Um, now, I'd, I'm not going to turn around and say, I'm going to have a, a segment based on conspiracy theories, because I'm not. Um, there are a whole range of conspiracy theories out there, but then at the same time, there's a whole bunch of stuff out there which is evidential, and it's fact, and the stuff that we do need to be aware of as to who we're up against. And so the, the necessary segment is going to be what I've called faux weapon. Now, as you can tell from the, uh, well, one of the pictures you've kind of covered up a little bit with my ugly mug, but never mind. So you've got the World Economic Forum and the other one is the United Nations. World Economic Forum is well known as the WEF and the UN is the UN. So the FO is, guess what? Mm, fuck off. World Economic Forum and United Nations. These people, these organisations, are the scourge of the world at the moment. Now, when I say the scourge of the world, it is because of certain activities that are taking place. I may put some stuff in the... Uh, program notes or whatever the fuck it's called on YouTube. So you can have a click and have a look for yourself. Um, some of the stuff that these organisations are looking to do on a completely undemocratic basis is the kindest way of saying it. Um, because no, nobody elects these people. No country elects these people. And it's full of the most up their own arse crazies um like I said, i'm not gonna i'm not gonna go into a conspiracy theory about this but i know what i know and i'll let you deal with whatever it is that you want to deal with but what i'm gonna what i am gonna concentrate on in the necessary segment is to give you an idea as to who these people are and in terms of who these people are 
whether you actually think it's a good idea to take any advice from them and whether you think it is a good idea for them to be running as the World Economic Forum and both the UN as well are interested in doing a global governance would you trust them to run the world so I'll give a background on some of the activities of the United Nations that you might not be familiar with <coughs> I will also do a rundown oh COVID I will also do a rundown of the membership of the World Economic Forum. Not too sure how I'm going to do that at the moment. I might just sort of pick and choose. I might do it alphabetically. Not too sure. Um, but essentially it will be a list of the world's worst economic criminals. Uh, corrupt. Morally bankrupt. Insidious, awful, awful people. And given the choice, would you really, really want these people running a bath, let alone the world? Now, I also understand on a practical perspective that when I talk about members of the World Economic Forum in particular, we're talking about some very, very large organisations which employ lots and lots of people. Again, it's not about destroying the jobs of lots and lots of people. It's about those people understanding who it is they work for, what it is that they're doing, and whether they actually want to assist with those programs. So, There'll be a, a little bit of information around that, but like I say, I'm not going to take it into some rabbit hole. I'm, you know, I'm not fucking David Icke. I'm not going to tell you that they're run by lizard people or any nonsense like that. So I'll just run through as best I can, give you some idea as to what these people are doing, what we're actually up against, the time scale, which is also very important. Some of you may be familiar with something called Agenda 2030. Um, I think they've actually upped that time scale a little bit. We'll see. Um, but yeah, I thought just there's a little bit of variety in the program so that uh, we don't just sit back and go, OK, right, it, everything, everything that's going on and that's and in, t in terms of how countries could be run, how we can all look towards making our own nations better, which by default should make other nations better. We're not going to be sitting here and going, all oh, right, everything is the government's fault or everything is the government to solve. Every problem is for the government to solve. Neither of those things are true. Corporations play a role as well. Individuals play a role. Everybody has a role to play. And everybody has a level of actual responsibility without going into double speak, which is one thing that I really, really can't stand about the modern world, where you have a whole bunch of insipid morons handing out documents telling people, oh God, I can't even think of an example at the moment, but just the most utter ass dribble that they come out with to pretend like they look like they care when everything that they say means the exact opposite of what's coming out of their mouth. I've got no interest in that sort of thing at all. We do need more plain speaking. We do need more understanding. And it's each of our responsibilities to be able to do it. So I've no idea how long I've been waffling on for. Um, but this, like I say, is to give you an explainer and an introduction as to, it's only a partial introduction as to who I am, because, like I say, you'll figure me out as things are going along. And it's to give you an idea as to what the programme is going to be doing. So it's it's not a, it's not a, one of these consumer affairs. It's not me sitting there and going, in today's news, there's this problem. This person said this and this person said that, and aren't they all terrible? 
it's about time we actually had a conversation about solutions and not just moaning about what somebody else has said. So, hopefully everybody will get to play a bit of a part. As things progress, we'll work out how everybody participates together. Um, I will try as best I can any comments that are on there. If anybody wants to look me up on LinkedIn and within reason, because I do understand I'm quite fussy on LinkedIn and that if anybody wants to connect to me, I do reject an awful lot of people. Um, so at least make sure that you're halfway intelligent. And yeah, we'll see, we'll see how things go. Um, like I said, I'm not a professional producer of videos, I'm not a professional bloody, you know, I'm not a YouTuber, none of this stuff. I do have a company to run as well. I'll try to do these around about once a week, I can't promise that. It's But, you know, if you just do the, uh, let me have a look, there you go, so I don't have to say it. Do all of that stuff. And then you'll know when the next program is up. You can add your input in the uh, the comments. Hopefully I'll have set it up properly so the comments are allowed. And uh, we'll take it from there. We'll see how we go. All right. Okay. So, that, yep, that be it. Take care and I'll see you next time. Bye.